Today you have three weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks and max. Well, your customers will come and kill you. Your competition will come and kill you. So three months later when I went to collect the plot, collect the money from the distributors, they said, here's 90% of your stock back, it never sold. What do, you, what do you do there? When I met someone from the US this afternoon and she said, you know, how, how is it like to work in India and be in India? I said, you tell me. You've been in India for the last 24, 48 hours. Doesn't it seem like the place to be right now? Can I graduate from a 60 to 80 rupee chai to a 350 rupee coffee and pay 5x? The answer is no. So I believe there is an opportunity in coffee for brands to operate between the 70 to 100 rupee price. I'm saying it on your show live. We are looking for a coffee for Bharat. We need a coffee for Bharat. Bharat, India needs a coffee. Do you have, uh, you know, good things to say about the government in the last 10 years, whatever happened and the kind of shift that we have seen in the minds of people who are in the field of business or... Yeah, I think there's positivity in being Indian. There's positivity in consuming Indian brands. There's pride in being Indian. India is something on the global stage. I think there's lots of good things that have happened. Right. Not saying everything is 100% perfect. Nothing in life can be perfect. But like you go outside of India and people are just excited about India right. and talking about India and when I met someone from the US this afternoon and she said you know how, how is it like to work in India and be in India I said you tell me you've been in India for the last 24 48 hours doesn't it seem like the place to be right now mm. even globally right so I think we've had a lot of good steps good steps forward specifically in the Ayurveda industry lots of good steps forward talking about Ayurveda let's let's talk about building a brand that is purely Ayurveda based was it possible before 2014 in your opinion in India has it happened before how did you think about it at that point in time this conversation about is it possible to build an Ayurveda brand do people believe in Ayurveda it's a very urban conversation and all of my friends and family started saying Ayurveda do people believe in it is it real is it this that Go out to the top five cities in India, everybody believes in Ayurveda. 70% mm. of Indian households consume at least one Ayurvedic product every day. It's a hair oil, it's a shampoo, it's a toothpaste, it's a pudin hara, it's an eno. These are all Ayurvedic products, yeah? So all Ayurveda is ingrained in our culture. Now, my job was to make that one product, two products, three products, four products, five products, right? So, and by the way, Dabar, Imami, Patanshi, Bedena, Zandu, Himalayas, all 100 crore plus businesses built over the last 40, 50 years. Um, except Patanji, which is sort of newer, but Ayurveda has always existed in our country. Mm. And so, you step outside Bombay, Delhi, Bangalore, Hyderabad, Ayurveda is everywhere. It's ubiquitous. Now, what we had to do as a company was make Ayurveda appealing and accessible to Paul. Because Ayurveda was appealing and accessible to Paul's mom and grandmom. But Paul needs to be excited and interested about Ayurveda. That was what we worked on as a company. Right. So, repackaging and rebranding the science to appeal to modern consumers, that was our journey. So let's talk a little bit about that journey. I mean, when you wanted to attract a Paul in, in that particular space that you were in, how easy or difficult was it for you at that point in time? And how much money were you spending in acquiring this one customer from a Delhi or a, say a Bombay or a Calcutta? Initially it was very tough because I went to these very urban, I went to make Dr. Vedas urban. We launched offline, we launched a hangover product, and we launched a Chavan Prash in capsule form. Multivitaminized version of Chavan Prash because we said we want to go urban, cool, sexy, fun and aspirational. It was very tough to convince Paul. But then when I went to Paul's cousin in Imphal and Vishal's cousin in Anantnag and I launched my online business, it became very easy to convince customers because they wanted high quality access to Ayurvedic products and care at the touch of their fingertips and digital enabled us to do that. So in 2017 November, we pivoted the business from an offline distribution business to an online focus D2C brand, I started speaking to the customers and I got some crazy things, crazy insights. Customers coming from all over the country, not speaking English. No one spoke English. Less than 20% of my customers spoke English. Right. So it was truly a Bharat brand that we were able to build. And how did you uh, lose more money than what you would have you know, spent at HBS in the first year? We made a lot of mistakes. We went offline. Uh, we went offline without realizing how much money we needed to market. We hired a sales team of 22 sales reps, put 10 lakhs of stock in market, not realizing that we have sold this to distributors. Only once distributors sell to retailers, retailers sell to Paul, 
and Paul pays me, Paul pays the retailer, do I get paid? Mm. Paul didn't buy my product. Mm. So three months later when I went to collect the plot, collect the money from the distributors, they said, here's 90% of your stock back, it never sold. What do, you, what do you do there? What do you do there? Right? So I think all of these mistakes made me lose. Right. And if I have to ask you, you know, at this point in time, in 2023, if I have to start a brand like this, what do I have to, you know, keep in mind? That's the first thing. And in 2023, how easy or difficult it is to it's damn tough point. cut it. In 2023, it's really hard because 2017, 2018 is when the first set of D2C brands came up in India. That time we didn't use this term D2C. Yeah. Then we started having um, some growth in 2019. 2020, March, pandemic hit us. Online went through the roof. Yeah. But with online going through the roof, the number of brands, in, while the number of customers increased, the number of brands increased significantly. 50 people, 50 Ayurveda brands have taken my D2C cohort based course. 5 0, only doing online Ayurveda. So competition is at its all time high in D2C. Now, with competition being at its all time high, you cannot do what we did. What did we do? We launched an Ayurveda business without knowing online, without knowing how to do online. And we took one year to figure the online market out. Yeah. Today you have three weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks and max. Where your customers will come and kill you. Your competition will come and kill you. So today if you are launching an, a D2C brand, forget Ayurveda, it's a yeah. D2C brand. You need to know your technicals, you need to get off the ground much faster. You need to understand the nuts and bolts of an e-commerce business much quicker. I need to build something that's not just based on performance marketing. You can't just rely on Google and Facebook ads to build your business like I did. Yeah. You have to build what's called a brand. You have to build the qualitative, you have to build the messaging, you have to build the aspiration. So it's definitely much harder than it was in 2017, 2018 to build a D2C brand. But the scale available if you get it right is much more. Right. Because there are just much more customers who trust buying online now. Right. And, and do you think that, you know, because of all these that is available right now, the CACs have gone down for a lot of companies. They have also understood the uh, kind of importance of taking down the acquisition cost for a lot of these startups. You also invest in a lot of startups and probably this is the biggest headache for all these startups who are looking at it. How then do you think this problem can be solved? So it's definitely a problem that's out there in the market right now, right? So for example, a lot of D2C players have come up. A lot of competition is there. And a lot of people are actually fighting for the same users who are going to buy these products. So how do you declutter this space? How do you solve for it? There's one word that answers this question. That word is moat. What is a moat? A moat is a water body that you will see around ancient forts and castles. That's an additional line of protection. Now, how is this relevant in business? It's relevant in business because you need some defensibility that uniquely differentiates your brand from the rest. For Geo, that differentiation was price. For Apple Airports, that differentiation was convenience. For Dr. Veris, that differentiation was form factor. For Mama, that differentiation was ingredient story and vegan and cruelty free. For Attenberg, that differentiation was technology, BLDC fans. So each of these have displayed a unique way to cut yourself through the clutter. Mm. And so if I think of brands today who want to exist and scale and really find their way, they have to find some USP or unique differentiator that helps them cut through the clutter of the brands and the competition and the um, and get into the mind space of the consumer. Right. So, but Arjun, very interestingly, you said that you have to find a, a, a USP within a category of coffee. I mean, there are five, six, seven, ten coffee brands that I know for a fact who are, you know, fighting it out as a D2C player. How do you differentiate a coffee? You can differentiate an in-cafe experience. You can differentiate in pop products. So, in-cafe experience, Starbucks third way are differentiated. They've built a nice business. Product experience, there are products like Subco, which are sort of the best, most artisanal products. But then there's a brand called Heka Coffee, which came on Shark Tank, which has a popcorn-flavored coffee and a palang tol coffee. I think there is one more opportunity in coffee and that opportunity is price. Now, I was discussing this with someone this morning. Yeah. There is chai, which you get sort of on the streets from a chai wala, etc. And that's in smaller cities, maybe 10 bucks, 15 bucks now. In Bombay, maybe you pay 20, 30 bucks for that chai. 
you go to chaios or chai point you'll pay 60 to 80 bucks for the chai from there if a customer wants to graduate to coffee what do they pay for coffee what do you pay at starbucks for coffee 350 350 rupees. yes now india is premiumizing we are building aspiration we have a burgeoning middle class that wants more and more and more can i graduate from a 60 to 80 rupee chai to a 350 rupee coffee and pay 5x the answer is no so i believe there is an opportunity in coffee for brands to operate between the 70 to 100 rupee price point i'm saying it on your show live we are looking for a coffee for bharat we need a coffee for bharat bharat india needs a coffee at that price point so that consumers can nicely graduate from tea i'll give you the example of the energy drink market what does red bull cost around 100 i think 125 so the energy drink market has red bull at 125 and then sting which is pepsi's product at what price point 30 20 bucks now sting is 1.4 billion bottles a year 2100 crore business Red Bull is doing 1700 crores at 125. Can a Sting customer graduate to pay 6x for Red Bull? Answer is no. See, aspiration is there. I have a Maruti 800 and I want a Mercedes. But I have to buy the Creta or the Sias or the Honda City or the Alto or the Swift in between, right? To get the Swift, then the City, then the Skoda, Octavia and then move to the Mercedes, right? Every customer has their journey. While I aspire for a Mercedes even though I'm driving a Maruti 800, that's fine. My journey has to go from here to there. And so lots of these spaces, you are seeing this unique mass premium price point open. Yeah. Open to play. And that's where scale is. Which one are you driving though? Which one am I driving? All. I'm an investor, I should drive all, right? <laughs> right, that was a trick question. But yeah, I mean, you, you passed. Let's move on to what happened next. When you actually decided that you want an exit, when you got that, and it's like in hand on cash deals that you were looking at. You had a lot of money in the bank now and you probably were thinking Abhi itne paise ka karna ke. Right? So, what was the next logical step? I didn't think about that, to be honest. I bought a house in the same building as my parents and then life moved on. Right. That's about it. I didn't buy a fancy car. I drive an MG EV. When I sold my business, my dad is very passionate about cars. Uh, so, he took me to the Audi and the Mercedes showroom because he likes cars. I didn't realize what a luxury car costs. I never bought a car. I bought one car in my life, Creta. And I want to upgrade from the Creta because Creta had been five years. And I saw the price of those cars and I was thinking to myself, between the price of my Creta and the price of this car is 10 startup investments. Mm. So I can't buy this expensive car. So nothing changed in life. I think, yes, it's nice to have financial security, to have your own home, etc., all of that. But that's it. Right. Uh, but, 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 but I'll tell yeah. you one thing which is very unique about an exit. Especially the age and the time frame that I got it at. You're totally free. Totally free. Yeah. Means you're like just like you never get this opportunity. Someone told me this. People go their whole lives mm. on the treadmill and they don't come off. Yeah. You have this unique, beautiful opportunity to be able to pause. Use it wisely.